Thank you all for coming out here this afternoon. Um, as part of telling the story uh, and understanding kind of where we got to, or how I in particular got to the story of the genius of Anne or the notion of uh, impact investing, what I thought I'd do today is share with you a, a brief snapshot in history kind of of my evolution in the space uh, and talk about some of the highlights across the industry. Uh, in addition, then speak to the portfolio process and then give, give some sense of lessons learned from the field, as well as talk to you about uh, where the industry is today. Uh, I'm gonna try to leave as much time at the end for, for questions, but uh, feel free to stop me along the way if there's something that, that is burning that you'd like to discuss. Um, in terms of my professional journey uh, through, this through this industry, I started my career in Bank of America, and for those of you that are familiar with that institution will recognize that's the old logo. So back then it was really Bank of America, not what it is today. And I started off in working in, La in Latin America. And this is really what kind of laid the foundation and the roots for my understanding of some of the global issues that uh, investments and portfolios had. For those of you with finance backgrounds also will know, I picked a great time to get into Latin American finance because that is when we had the Mexican peso devaluation and what was called the tequila effect. And so I saw wealth uh, and a middle class instantaneously eroded uh, throughout Latin America and really laid some of the foundation for my thinking in the space. Uh, from that, uh, moved into uh, financial services with AXA and as John spoke about in the early days uh, in working, you know, particularly in the Bay Area with, uh, with the families and, and entrepreneurs who had had success, this idea of, well, wanting to express some social values was, was a part of the discussion. And what was the tool we had available to us? Well, that was the old adage of kind of socially responsible investing. This idea of simply investing, making investments that had a negative screen. At the same time, there was an interesting movement because, of course, we all know this was a time in the Bay Area in particular where there was a strong emphasis on technology. And the, you know, the one twist, I would say, that was placed on social responsible investing at that time was to recognize that, well, you know what, some of these technology companies, you know, they don't have a, they, you know, technology is, demarket, is, is really helping democratize information. And so, you know, let's invest in some of these technology companies as an expression of social responsible investing. From that, uh, co-founded a firm, and I'm happy to see my, my partner, Kurt Rousey, here in that, in, from that business, uh, in, a form, in a business called Navitas. And what was unique about this, you know, in the old world, it was all about selling, you know, selling products and getting paid to sell products. And Kurt and I met and had the chance to learn that, you know what, that really wasn't what clients were looking for. We really needed to think about clients differently and understanding what their needs were. And we were one of the first firms to really get involved in not only standing the financial objectives of a family, but really understanding what were, their, what were, their, what were the values that were driving uh, their, their goals for their family's wealth. And once you start to uncover that, then the question becomes, well, how do you apply that? And that led us to going into a period of time in which there was a lot of innovation, in particular in, in what we call today impact investing. Several key things uh, happened during that time. Uh, first of all, uh, we began working with the Cale Felicitas Foundation, which many of you uh, know is a portfolio that a lot of the work that I've done in the space uh, has been an expression of, but you know, we started off with trying to do something slightly different than what we had in classic social response investing, and that was to take those values that we that we understood from our wealth planning process and translate them to into custom negative screens. Nonetheless, they were negative screens, and so we deployed that uh, in conjunction with a firm called Parametric. We then later uh, moved into the idea of understanding that. This, I learned about this buzz, or this word in the foundation space, program-related investing. And although this has been something that's been around since 1969, here we were working with foundations and talking to foundations, and no one understood what this thing was. And when I looked at it and understood what it was, although on its face it sounds like, and people automatically associate it with a, an investment that is a subsidized investment or an investment where you're not, you don't care about the return, you're simply looking to have programmatic impact. I recognize as a portfolio manager, as an investment professional, well, wait a second. If a program related investment effectively allows you to make an investment and have it count as a grant, that's a substitution for what, from an investment perspective, is the greatest risk capital. Meaning, normally in a grant, I give the money away. Yes, I have a social impact, but I get nothing in return financially. Well, if I could take a piece of the portfolio from a portfolio perspective, give it away, satisfy that obligation, and yet actually have even just the, that money come back to me, 
from an investment perspective and building a portfolio, that really, that really made sense. A couple other things that were significant, of course, during that time was the dot-com blow-up. And this is, for, in particular, for any of you in, this, in, the, in the audience that, I believe, that are advisors, it became a very nice thing to do to be able to sit there and talk to your clients and, and have to reel with and deal with what was clearly an economic situation, but nonetheless still be able to point to the social or environmental benefits associated with the portfolios that we were managing. And so that was an important time. This was also the time when Muhammad Yunus won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in, um, in microfinance and really saw a, a lot of attention being brought to the, industry, to the universe of microfinance. Uh, from there, was uh, having recognized and decided that it was time to really focus and wanting to really build out the capability and capacity in the sector of impact investing, kind of felt that it was important to do this from a true institutional investment perspective as opposed to having a, attempting to do this from a boutique environment. It felt like in order for it to have legitimacy, if it wasn't associated with a large capital base and a large institution, it would be very difficult to do. And as a, and as a result of that, was fortunate to join uh, Guggenheim Partners as a portfolio manager within our business. And over the course of three years, we grew what was an initial $10 million dedicated to impact to over $400 million in pursuit of impact. And this really you know, allowed me to go out and literally travel the world and assess and evaluate and begin to build uh, the, re the, the understanding of what, what was out there. It was also a time in which a lot of other activity was happening, uh, broadly speaking, in the industry. For those of you familiar, there was a very famous article that came out of the Los Angeles Times, which raised this question to the Gates Foundation with regards to how they were managing their corpus and how effectively their corpus was working directly against some of the programmatic areas that they were spending their philanthropic capital to do. This led, uh, this led us to publish the first monograph in the space, which was with, around foundations and this notion of mission-related investing, where I was fortunate to collaborate with Steve Gadecki and Doug Bauer in laying out and creating a series of frameworks and tools that were featured in, that, in, in that, that piece that got very wide circulation right out the gate. It was also an interesting time, for those of you that don't know, um, again, so we went from Mohamed Yunus winning a Peace Prize around microfinance to Compartamos, which is a, a going public on, in, uh, out of Mexico. So here was a financial institution, a bank, that was designed and was serving the poor that went public, and as a result of that, created an enormous amount of wealth actually for the shareholders of the bank, which were, in many cases, many nonprofits that had been deploying social capital. So blew out of, on one hand, it blew the myth instantaneously that social, you know, emphasizing a social objective doesn't generate a financial return. It generated a tremendous financial return to its investors. But it really raised the question of this debate around, well, what, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to make money or are we, are we trying to have a, a positive impact? Later on, the industry really coalesced around, in particular with the, uh, the work that came out of, by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Monitor Institute, in, this, in the piece that really codified the industry around this term impact. Until this point, the industry, which still does slightly today, really suffered from a, effectively a Tower of Babel. Everybody called it something different. And you know, we, we, we were very appreciative of the capital that Rockefeller spent to effectively try to bring the industry and in recognizing that if it was going to be successful mobilizing capital, we really needed to get the language of the space. And the, the chart that Andy showed at the beginning effectively came out of the work that Monitor did. So still today was a very important piece in laying the foundation for what is impact investing today. This was also the time that, we, that I then worked again with uh, Steve Gadecki, and we co-authored the, the book that's available here today, Solutions for Impact Investors, where we took the lessons learned from the days of starting here and allocating portfolios and trying to put them together in a very simple how-to monograph to allow investors to, to understand some of the space. The space continues to evolve. There continues to be very important and significant um, uh, developments I think one of the most significant of, of late was, the, the, for those of you not familiar, was in 2010, J.P. Morgan. Here was the first time when a bulge bracket major global financial institution in paper put something in writing about impact investing. 
And this was a significant, so on that hand, I applaud and was very pleased to see that significant work come out. But at the same time, I actually have fundamental difference of opinion with a, a primary thesis that the paper holds. And as in this paper, they attempted to classify impact investing as an idea of it being an asset class. And from our piece and my work and experience, we truly believe impact investing is a methodology that can be applied across all asset classes. And that's the work that, that we showed. But nonetheless, the sheer fact that Jamie Dimon gave a specific mandate and created a specific pool of J.P. Morgan's proprietary capital to be deployed in this sector really helped legitimize, uh, legitimize the industry in, in, a, in an important way. And to, along the way today, most happy to share, of course, the relationship and the work and the leading work that folks like the Elios Foundation uh, have done. And as a result of this journey, I have now formed a, a firm called Sonin Capital, which is dedicated uh, to this work. And this is something that, uh, whereas all along this journey, it had been a, it had been a question of be, working within a financial institution or financial construct where we are attempting to integrate in the impact. It's now, fi I've finally been fortunate to put, get into a position and feel that the market is ready for an institution that's dedicated to impact that has an ability to integrate the non-impact piece. So it's fi it finally, it's taken a while, but finally been able to kind of turn this thing on its head. So what do we do? How do we do this? How, do, how, do, how does one embrace the genius of Anne and the notions and the ideas that Jim Collins talked about when he said the best companies embrace the genius of Anne, not the tyranny of or, and do things together? Well, if you take that diagram that Andy showed, this idea of you know, people approaching things from a financial first perspective or an impact first perspective, it's really about understanding their intent. And that intent naturally drives the process. And although people get hung up on thinking about this as a very complicated story or situation, it's really simply two sides of the same coin. Well, if the emphasis is on financial, well, that would naturally lead one to then initiate the process through understanding the financial characteristics of the investment opportunity. If your emphasis is on the impact, well, that would lead one to want to understand what are the potential social environmental benefits that this opportunity offers. But it doesn't stop there because you have to do both. So you flip the coin over on each side and you find yourself after you've assessed and evaluated and ensure that it meets your financial criteria, and recognize that those financial criteria should, should not be in any way, shape, handicapped as a result of this social impact. You simply assess it and then understand that social impact and nonetheless apply the same on the other side and understand that even though you're pursuing this or your intent and motivation was to pursue something for a social environmental benefit, it's, not only is it okay, it's a requirement. The operable word here is it's an investment. So it's impact first investment, and that requires a degree of understanding because where this often, in particular in philanthropic circles, becomes an issue is what people fail to recognize. It doesn't matter how good the intent or the idea or the belief of that social or environmental benefit that, or outcome can be achieved if the fundamental model, be it the team, the management, the revenue strategy, all those things that are necessary, guess what? you're not gonna have an impact because it's not gonna be sustainable, it's not gonna last. And so, very important piece. When doing this in a portfolio process, it's important to have these things, again, apply that same rigor and discipline and document the governance, document all of this and make sure that those, these investments are compliant within your, your, what we call the impact investment policy. From there, it's now time to start measuring the back end of the process. And really, with, again, no different. It's two sides of the same coin. In the case of your financial first, well, what do you want to understand? You want to make sure you're getting a, comp a competitive risk-adjusted rate of return relative to the same types of investments that can be made without impact. So if, it's, if you're investing in public equities, well, your benchmark, if, if it's global public equities, you use the MSCI world. You don't handicap and use some other benchmark. Well, if you're... If you went into this investment from an impact first perspective, well, then the first thing is to measure that and understand and, and, and determine that. But once again, it's the and. And when you come back, it's now time to not only understand either the financial or the impact first, but do the work and understand the other side of the equation as well. So now having done this over this career and uh, during this time, there have been a, a couple key lessons learned that I thought were important to share. 
you know, the first question that we get most often is this question of cost and trade-off. It's always, it, it comes up in every one of these discussions and it comes up in many conversations with investors. What is the trade-off? There must be a trade-off associated with impact investing. And from our perspective, you know, the answer uh, to that question is no, there's not. When done with the same rigor and discipline and taking the methodology and approach that, we, that I just described, we feel confidently that that's not the case. And we can point to that uh, in, with actual tangible examples. I already gave the example of Compartamos as an investment that people had in 2008 when global equities were down over 44%, our portfolios, our, our high impact portfolios were generating returns in the four to 6%. Even program related investments, though the purest of those, of those investments that needed to be impact first, over the last seven years, we've had investments that are, serve, that are solving for community based energy solutions in the developing world deliver to us a consistent 5% return. Now, 5%, relative to, on a consistent basis, relative to what's been happening, kind of begs the question of, of, of really showing these things as being different. The other thing that's important with regards to cost and trade-off is that this industry is, simil is, is quite similar to the times when, you know, 20 years ago when people were talking about emerging market investing, you know, the, in public equities. The, all, the whole idea was, oh my God, you, you know, it's too risky, it's too volatile, this isn't something one should do. Now, 20 years later, there isn't a single global institution, endowment, pension fund that doesn't have an exposure. And why? Because they quickly learned that although on its, on its face as an asset class, emerging market public equity is more volatile, when added to a portfolio as a result of the lack of correlation that it exhibits to the other asset classes, it actually lowers the overall volatility of a portfolio. And we believe that impact investing is, occupies that same space. One of the other key lessons to follow is the, the issue of people falling in love with, be it an the impact or an entrepreneur. They get so enamored with the idea of what the social benefit uh, or environmental benefit could be that, they, that on those merits alone, they commit or make an investment or try to drive to an investment structure solution, which may be the wrong one. And this, and this is one, again, that it, it becomes critically important. And we've seen this, and we've had a number of, of situations where you know, the idea was there, the entrepreneur perhaps was there, but the rest of the business wasn't properly organized as a result of that, uh, we've had failure. We've had a number of funds, uh, for example, you know, uh, one of the funds, uh, an Africa healthcare fund that one of my team members today was actually involved in. You know, great concept, Africa healthcare got, you know, got a pot of money from, the, uh, from OPIC uh, at, to, to get it started, got a grant from Rockefeller, so you're thinking, this thing, how could it fail? Well, it failed. Right, because it came to the market at the wrong time and was not successful as a result of that. The other thing that this industry has, just like every other part of the investment world, there's a herd mentality. Not to keep picking on microfinance, but you know, when we were making microfinance investments 2004, 2005, 2000, this was a great time, and we got the benefits from that. As a result of those track, too many people, oh my God, microfinance, look at these returns, and they came running in. They came running in in 2007, 2008, and worse, they came in in 2009, and have had their head handed to them because the, the industry, they, they came in as just like any other part of the, you know, just like gold is going to probably have and other resources and all other aspects. They came in at the peak. And as a result of that, that's been their experience. And it's an, this, is an, this is a critical one, an important one, because too many people who thought they were kind of jumping in or, or willing to take that chance took the chance at the wrong time in the wrong space. And, and the hope is that, you know, they'll actually look back and reflect and realize that it wasn't because of the impact that they lost their money. It's because no different had they invested in, in collateralized mortgage obligations in 2007 or they bought shares of Lehman. It had to do with the fundamentals of, what the, of, of, the, of the investment and the time and, and the cycle in the market as opposed to the actual investment thesis. The other, uh, the other part is the realities of capital formation. People, people think that it's diff you know, you often hear, and it is difficult to raise money for, th for these impact investments. But again, it's difficult across the board. With the type of, vol the type of volatility people are, that the markets are experiencing, the uncertainty that exists in these markets, it doesn't matter whether you have impact or not impact, it is just plain simply difficult to get asset owners to part with their money into any type of investment. And again, this idea that it's because of the impact needs to be wiped from people's minds and just recognize that it's really about the difficulties of making investments. And 
good investments with good teams, with great track records and great structures, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get funded. But it's not the fault of impact. It's just the realities of the market we exist in. One of the other big challenges is what it takes to measure impact. You know, this is something that I call the third rail of the industry. It's been something that people struggle with, uh, and we, we struggle with it for several reasons. One, it's difficult, but more importantly, it's difficult because of several factors. One, everybody wants to measure something different. And so as a, as a investee, as an impact investee, uh, it, becomes, it can become overwhelmingly burdensome to respond to your requirements, your requirements, and your requirements. And so what's needed here is to adopt a series of standards that can facilitate and allow uh, this, this work to be done. In the meantime, the caution to those that are coming new to the space is to not let this be an excuse as to not to do it. I'm not suggesting that you should take a subscribe to the simple solution of, well, impact, you know it when you see it. We're saying take the time, take the energy to measure it. Wait for these systems to develop, but don't sit on the sidelines. Don't, don't wait until it's, it's a perfect solution because the opportunities are today and are real. And then the last piece we call, I call the elusive exit and liquidity. And more often than not, once again, people look, you know, people look to the notion of impact as being what, what, what creates this. But again, it's simply looking at the realities of the market cycles. These are new investments. These, these are investments that are new. And yes, the ecosystem has not been built out to create the secondary markets to allow some of the private companies. The, the, the exchanges don't, the exchanges don't uh, have yet to price in or recognize some of the values that John was referring to that are being built, that the value that's being created in these businesses, and so that will, that will take time. So how has a lot of this been applied and, and made real and, uh, and thought through with, in terms of the work that we're doing at, uh, on the Elios Corpus portfolio? Eli as you, when you go through this process of understanding impact, it's also about understanding the impact areas that, in this case, the Elios Foundation is pursuing, and recognizing that their ability, that, that the emphasis of impact for Elios is in this upper quadrant, and as a result, but that's from an impact perspective. When you translate that into the types of asset classes or investments that are available to them, it's this effort of kind of going through and mapping and recognize when we look at opportunities in the area of health and education and sustainable economic development for the portfolio, that's really going to lead us to a very, a, a, a three asset classes where we have the highest likelihood of being able to identify those opportunities. And that's then areas like emerging market debt, other types of notes and debt obligations, or in private equity. And that's, and, and, and that's an important piece to understand. How you choose to define your impact is going to drive you to where or how you're going to be able to express that impact. And then from an asset allocation perspective, which I'm not going to show here today, we've also had to assess, assess and evaluate the, spend, the, the policy that drives the asset allocation. And it's, again, this and approach of saying, OK, we went through the process to determine what are the financial needs of Valios, and as a result of that, developed an asset allocation or portfolio strategy. We've also overlaid the notion that they want to have impact. And so now we know if we're going to have an allocation in emerging market debt to say, let's just randomly say 10%, well, that's an area where those dollars have an ability to have a high impact. And as we start looking at other areas, such as broad fixed income or US public equities, with a mission and thesis that, that Elios has, we're not going to be able to hit it on the head, but we will be able to find things that are able to offer and at least evaluate and integrate into the process the things that John was talking about, about recognizing the ESG values. Or in the case of the public equity portfolio uh, for Elios, we've, ex we've, dis we've deployed that into a, even our US equity, having a link back to the emerging market thesis that Elios subscribes to by investing in a fund and a manager that looks at the value chain, which often leads you back to decisions around how are these companies here in the US that are public companies producing goods and services, how are they generating those products and services? Because you often find yourself getting back into the emerging markets that way. And so it's this ability to kind of bring the themes together. In conclusion, where is the industry today? Really see a barbell occurring in this industry. On the left side, we have a need for new capital and the requirements that new capital has when coming into the space. 
These new entrants, which tend to be, again, other financial intermediaries in particular, which are the gatekeepers to capital, in order for them to come in, what they're seeking are really kind of off-the-shelf products, things that are diversified, turnkey solutions, which leads to an emergence and need of fund-to-funds and multi-manager platforms. For those of you who were here last session and saw France break impact, what Impact Assets is doing and what other firms are doing in terms of creating uh, these products, uh, they're responding to what is a clear need in the industry. At the other end of the spectrum have been the folks that have been doing this for a while and other leaders such as Elios that are emerging. The irony there is they've done this. They've done this on their own. They had to do this the hard way because these products didn't exist. But today, because of their, their, because of their focus and emphasis on that impact, they're really seeking to generate more impact and that leads and very direct defined impact, which is leading them to want to do far more hands-on investing. And so what you see as a, in response to that are organizations and the efforts that Elios is doing in terms of creating mechanisms and vehicles to aggregate others into direct deals, as well as associations or organizations such as Tonic, which is formed as an angel network, and an organization that we're involved in as well in CREO, which is Clean Renewable Energy Opportunities for Family Offices, that where we've created basically a, 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 a peer-to-peer gathering spot where, fam- where families and family offices who have a lot of experience and have a capital to, blow, to deploy in very specific sectors, be it a Tanzanian rice farm or other areas of kind of focused areas of investing in the space uh, are what are coming together. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that the traditional fund industry is overly saturated, but the notion that, well, there aren't just enough funds out there. We're talking, there are a number of funds that are fund two, fund three. You know, Carl Palmer just walked in from Beartooth there on their second fund. Uh, a number of funds, if you look across the portfolios that we're investing in are two and three. So that market has matured. Uh, and the key now is to how do we bring in more capital? Well, we need to recognize th- these trends and what's happening and be sure we respond to them. So with that, I'll stop and take any and all questions.